Thank you for joining us today. We're excited you came across this message. The sermon you are about to watch is from our verse-by-verse -verse study through the Gospel of Mark. If you're joining us for the first time, I want to be the first to say, welcome to Hope Church. Go ahead and open up the Hope Church LV app or visit hopechurchlv.com and click connect with us to fill out a short digital connection card. Once again, thanks for joining us today. Good morning, Hope Church. It is so good to see you this morning. If you've got your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open them to Mark chapter 5. We're going to be there in just a few minutes. But as you're turning there, I want to see if you and I are similar in this way. There is nothing that makes me more irritated in all the world than having to wait. I don't know about you, but I, I have to believe that I'm not the only one in the room this morning that doesn't like waiting. Anybody in the room willing to admit that waiting is, in fact, the worst? <laughs> Hallelujah. I know I'm not alone with my church family. Now, listen, as we talk about this, I'm going to say something, and, and you are going to judge me. I know that in advance, but you just need to know I am secure. I know who I am in Jesus, so judge me all you want, all right? But... I am not a very big fan of Disneyland. Somebody said, preach. <laughs> now listen, I, listen, here's why I don't like it. Some of you are like, how in the world can you not like the happiest place on earth? Here's how. Because of lines, people. Lines upon lines upon lines. All that equals is waiting upon waiting upon waiting. I mean, seriously, you wait like an hour and a half for a two-minute ride. That's a bad investment. It's not very good. <laughs> They're mediocre. <laughs> it's a bad investment of time and money, <laughs> right? Now, I do not like waiting. I do not like it. I do not like it. Now, I know this is a problem for me. I know this is a problem for me. My wife last night told me, and she said, you're going to say this in the sermon this morning. I am, honey. I am. She said, Trent, you need more patience. I know, I know I need more patience. And I know all of you need more patience as well. We all need more patience, but let's just be honest. Let's be, somebody's like, yeah, I need patience. Let's just be honest. The world we live in does not make developing patience very easy. Am I wrong? Right? Like the fact that I can order an Amazon Prime book before I go to bed and then pay an extra $2 and it be at my doorstep in the morning is unbelievable. I don't want that to change in any way, shape, or form. However, it doesn't make developing patience very easy, <laughs> right? Everything in our world is trying to speed up, get a little faster. It's, it's making developing patience really, really difficult. I think we can all agree this morning that waiting is the worst. But what we're going to see as we study God's word this morning is that though waiting is the worst, here's what we're going to find. Waiting is where God works. That God works in our waiting. You see, it's one thing for us to be waiting for something we want, right? Like a book or waiting in line at Disneyland. But it's quite another thing to be waiting on something that you deem a very significant need in your life. You see, there's many of you in this room right now and you're in a season of waiting. You're waiting on God for an open door, an answered prayer, a job opportunity, a good report from a doctor, maybe even a spouse to be married to, a child to be born, maybe even for justice to be served. And you're fighting. You're not passively waiting. You're fighting. You're fighting for faith. You're fighting to trust God in this season. But if we're just being honest this morning, it's really, really hard and see, while everything in our society is trying to speed up and make life easier and faster, what we know from God's word is this, that God works on a different timetable. God works on a different timetable. In God's mind, waiting is a perfectly acceptable option. Why? Here's why. Because waiting is where God works. Waiting, God works in our waiting. So here's what I want to say to you. And every single, every single person who's in this room, whether you're in a season of waiting or not, here's what I want to say to you. You can trust God in your waiting. You can trust God no matter what season you're in this morning. You see, every single one of us is either in a season of waiting, just coming out of a season of waiting, or heading into a season of waiting. Just wait. Your waiting season is coming. <laughs> okay. It's coming for us, no matter who we are. 
And I want to say to us this morning, we can trust God while we wait. You see, in the story that we're going to study this morning, we're going to find a man who is very familiar with waiting. And his life circumstance brought him to a situation where he had to wait, catch this, not because of himself, but actually because of God himself. And he was faced with a central question from the Lord. And here's the question. I want to put it up on the screen. Will you trust me while you wait? This was being asked of the man that we're going to talk about today. And this is being asked of every single one of us here this morning. And see, I want to be a person and we want to be people that no matter how difficult life is, we trust God despite the difficulty. See, I want to be a kind of person that life could be so bad around me that everything in my life could be falling down around me, but because of my dependence and trust in God, I'm okay despite the chaos. That's the kind of person I want to be. And so what we're going to do as we study God's word this morning is we're just going to ask two primary questions. Here's the first question we're going to ask. We're going to ask, why is it so difficult to trust God in our waiting? I think we can all agree that trusting God while we wait is a difficult thing. Why is it so natural for us not to trust him in our waiting? And then after we answer that, we're going to answer this final question. Why can we trust God in our waiting? See, it's one thing for us to acknowledge the things that cause it cause us difficulty in trusting God, but we need to remind ourselves of all the reasons why we can, in fact, trust God despite those difficulties. Amen? And so as we study God's word this morning, with, with this as a foundation, we're going to jump back into the story. I want to encourage you, if you haven't listened to any of our previous messages through the book of Mark, I want to encourage you to do that because the story that we're going to study today comes right on the heels of everything else we've just been talking about for the last couple weeks. Over the last couple weeks, we've been seeing specifically Jesus' power and authority over specific things, over nature, over demons and the demonic, over disease last week. And this week, we're going to study Jesus' authority and power over even death itself. And so with that as our foundation, I want to give you just very quickly a sermon in a sentence a sermon in a sentence to just kind of show you this is where we're headed. This is what we're trying to see from this story so you know where we're going. Here's the sermon in a sentence. God graciously purposes our waiting. Do you see that? God graciously purposes our waiting to demonstrate his power and authority in our lives. You see, friends, I believe there's a significant chance that you and I miss out miss out on what God is trying to do in us and through us when we don't trust him in our waiting season. And so with that as our foundation, we're gonna jump back into Mark chapter five. And just so you know, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna read a little bit of the story and then talk a little bit. Read a little bit and talk a little bit and then we'll get to our questions. Mark chapter five, beginning in verse 21. I hope you got your Bibles there. We want to be people of the book who have our faces in the book. Mark chapter five, Starting in verse 21, this is what God's word says. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. So pause just for a moment. Pastor Scott, last week, introduced us to this man named Jairus. And so for sake of review, just very quickly, here's what we know about Jairus. Jairus was a leader in the Jewish synagogue. As a result of him being a leader, he was also a man of prestige, meaning people knew who he was. We know that because here in the story, we see this man named. So he was a man of prestige. He was known around the city. And as a result of that, he also was probably somebody who was very, very wealthy. He was well off. He wasn't struggling in the money department. All of us would want to have the social status of Jairus. But what we're going to see here in the life of Jairus is that just because Jairus' social status was solid, it didn't make him immune from the difficulties of life. And that's true for you and me, friends. Just because our social status is awesome doesn't mean that we get excused from the trials and difficulties of life. And what was his difficulty? His difficulty in trial was that he has a 12-year-old daughter 
who is incredibly, incredibly sick and on the verge of death. And so what does he do? He comes and falls at the feet of this man named Jesus. We talked about this last week, but in this culture, the way this Jewish leader Jairus was acting was very out of character because nobody of his prestige and position would fall down at Jesus' feet. And so though it was out of character for a Jewish leader to do this, as a father, we know it's very much in character because any good father in his position would be doing the same thing. And so he's completely desperate. He's in a very urgent situation. He doesn't know what to do. And so in his final attempt at hope, he goes to this man named Jesus and pleads for his help. Jesus here hears the man's request, hears Jairus' request, and he goes with them. He goes with him to meet his need. Notice, friends, here in the story, just right here as we begin, notice the willingness of Jesus to meet this man's need. See, it, it, it seems from the story, Jesus doesn't know Jairus. Jairus knows of this man, Jesus. And yet, even in this moment, a request is asked of Jesus, and Jesus goes to meet that need. I want to encourage you, Hope Church, that God is very, very interested in meeting your significant need. I don't know what you're walking in here with today, a struggle, a burden, a, a prayer request. A, you're waiting. Here's what I want to say to you. God is very interested in meeting your needs. If he wasn't, he wouldn't be a heavenly father. He would be a horrible father. He cares and desires to meet the needs of his children. But in this moment, Jesus is going with Jairus, and then an interruption happens. This is what we talked about last week. An interruption happens in the form of a woman who has been sick for 12 years, who in a desperate attempt to be healed, grabs the clothes of Jesus, and in a moment, the authority and power of Jesus is demonstrated in her life, and she is healed of her disease. And Jesus, in this moment, he could have healed her and kept going, but Jesus here stops. He pauses. He waits in order to have a conversation with this woman. This is what we studied last week, but I can't help but think as we talk about Jairus and his situation, could you imagine what Jairus is feeling in this moment? Think about it. He, he's come to Jesus with an urgent need. Jesus, I need your help. My, my daughter is nearing death. Can you come lay your hands on her and heal her? And Jesus says, yes, I'll go do that. And they're on their way. And then Jesus stops. Jesus stops. If I'm Jairus, here's what I'm doing. Jesus, what are you doing? Seriously, what are you doing? What, why the heck are you stopping? Did you not remember that we were going somewhere? We, we've, I've got an urgent need. My daughter is about to die. Here's what I'm doing if I'm Jairus. Genuinely, this is just my heart. Jairus, or Jesus, do you not care about what I asked you about? Do you not care that my daughter is dying? Why in the world are you pausing with such an urgent need? Here's my question for you, Hope Church. You ever been there? You ever questioned Jesus' actions? You ever had a gyrus moment where in your season of waiting and having to slow down and wait on God, you start wondering and questioning his character? This is what I have to imagine Jairus is doing. Now think about this. As readers of the story, we probably know more information about this woman who was just healed than Jairus did. Think about this. this the text tells us that this woman was sick for 12 years, meaning that she probably could have gone another day without being healed. But not Jairus' daughter. Everything we know about Jairus' daughter is that she, is, she only has minutes remaining. And so Jesus looks at an urgent need, and then one that could have been dealt with a little bit later, and he does something crazy. He heals the, the other one. Pastor Tim Keller talking about this, noting this, here's what he says about this exact instance. He says, this makes no sense. It's absolutely irrational. In fact, it's worse than that. It's malpractice. If these two were in the same emergency room, any doctor who treated the woman first and let the little girl die would be sued. And Jesus is behaving like such a reckless doctor. Do you feel the tension in the story? Do you feel how 
even just this few moments of waiting for Jairus must have felt like an eternity for him. Jesus, what are you doing? Why are you making me wait? Back to the story. Jesus heals the girl with the issue of blood, and then this happens. Let's look at our Bibles. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. In this culture, you just need to know that professional mourners, how would you like that job? Professional mourners were hired when people passed away. So most likely, the people in this story causing a commotion, weeping and wailing loudly, were people who didn't really care about the family's loss. They were just interested in getting a paycheck. And Jesus, seeing this, knowing this, because he cares for this family, Jairus' family is not going to have any of that because they're ingenuine. And so look what he does, verse 39. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. Note that. We'll come back later. And they laughed at him. You see that? Their weeping turned to laughter in a moment. These people were not genuine. And so Jesus put them all outside. And he took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum. And the girl, little girl, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately, Immediately, the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years old. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this, and he told them to give her something to eat. Friends, this is God's word. From this story, we're gonna ask and answer two questions that I believe this story helps us answer. Here's the first question that we're gonna wrestle with. Why is it difficult to trust God in our waiting. From this story, I think we're gonna see two reasons, two realities from Jairus' life that give us insight into why it's so difficult for us to trust God in our season of waiting. Here's the first reason. Number one, it's because fear develops inside of us. Fear develops inside. Look at this on the screen. But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, to Jairus, do not fear. Only believe. Why does Jesus in this moment speak first to the fear in Jairus' heart? And I need you to catch this. Here's why. I believe he spoke first to the fear in Jairus' life because he knows that nothing will kill your faith faster than fear. Nothing, friends, will kill your faith faster than fear. Jesus in this story gives two commands to Jairus. The first one is do not fear. The way it's written in the Greek is the strongest way possible for Jesus to command Jairus not to fear. It's Jesus literally saying to him, Jairus, look at me in the eyes. Do not, do not, do not be afraid. Don't ever be afraid, Jairus. He says the second thing, only believe. Jairus, the only thing I'm asking you to do right now is to trust me, Jairus. Do you trust me? Do not fear. Just trust me. See, Jesus knows that apart from removing the fear from Jairus' life, that faith in Jesus would not really be possible. It's as if Jesus knows that in Jairus' heart, there's not enough room for faith and fear to coexist at the same time. So he wants to remove the fear and instill faith in Jairus. And the same thing is true for us. I know the times in my life where I lacked the most faith and trust in God was because I was fearing something more than I was fearing God. Some of you know, if you know me, you know this story, but when I was 18 years old, I was living in Virginia at the time, going to college, and when I was 18 years old, in the most sincere way possible, I really felt like God had called me to live in Las Vegas and be a part of extending God's kingdom here in this unbelievable city. And I was 18 years old, and in this 
honest as I can be, it was the most like strong, genuine and like sense I had ever had from the Lord up until that point in my life. And so I remember I talked to a whole bunch of people, called my dad, did all this different stuff because I was like, I think God might be calling me to Vegas. And I was so excited about it. I was ready for it to happen right now. You know what I'm saying? Like he called me to Vegas. Let's get to Sin City. Let's go. Like I was pumped. And so um, I was so excited about it that the first time Griffin, my now wife, and I ever had a date, if you want to call it that, it was more, most, more like just a, a random afternoon hangout after uh, a church service. We were eating at this really mediocre place called Zaxby's. Anybody ever have Zaxby's? If you ever have or if you have it and you're interested, don't be. It, it's just a really mediocre version of Cane's, all right? So Cane's is way better. But we're sitting at this place called Zaxby's, and we're having a conversation, and I'm so excited. God's calling me to Las Vegas, and I, I just told Griffin. We were having a, what us young people call a DTR, a define the relationship talk. You'd be surprised how many people don't know what a DTR is. But we were having a DTR. Let's just define this thing. Let's see who we really are. And, and so I told Griffin, I said, hey, listen, here's the deal. Um, if we're going to date, we better date really seriously or not at all because God's calling me to Las Vegas, and this long distance thing isn't going to work. So we, we better be all in this thing, or, or not at all. And I won't tell you what she said in response, but, um, but I, was, I was sure. <laughs> I'm going to Vegas now. Now, if you know the story, my story, obviously, I'm here in Las Vegas. When did I get here? Here's when I got here, four years later. Four years later. And now I know a lot of you have been waiting a lot longer than four years, but for me, it was four years. And while I waited... For those four years, you know what started creeping up in my heart? Here's what started creeping up. Fear. Fear. Fear that maybe I had missed God. Fear that maybe I had misheard him. Fear that it was actually just my dream for my life coming to Las Vegas and not necessarily his calling for my life. And because I thought maybe I had misheard God and fear there, it started to develop into more fears, fear that maybe I didn't, wasn't able to discern the still small voice of the Spirit of God in my life. And, and so now I'm wondering, man, like, am I, have I really been following Jesus with this desire and with this calling? I, I, I'm worried. I'm, I'm missing God. I, I've got this fear in me. And then I started fearing, man, what is everybody else going to think? Because I had told all my friends, all these other people, they had been praying that it would happen, and then it wasn't happening, and now I'm fearing, what do people think of me? Do they think I'm foolish? Can they really trust my walk with God if I'm getting this so wrong? This is what happens when we wait. You know what followed shortly after that fear? What followed shortly behind that fear in my own heart was doubt. Doubt of God. Doubt that God really was going to do what I felt like he had called me to do. God, doubt that God would really keep his word because four years just seemed too long. Waiting. Waiting. Would God really do what he said? And praise God, he did. We're here. We're here. We're here. He did it. Just four years later, right? Now, one of the reasons I think we struggle to have faith in God is because we fear the things that will come if we really have faith and follow God wherever he leads. See, some of you have entered this building this morning and, and you're here and God is calling you to trust him. He's calling you in a new direction. He's calling you towards a new step of obedience. He might be calling some of you to the nations like Matt and Melissa and you're paralyzed by fear and so you haven't said yes to God yet. I wanna encourage you, friends. Nothing will kill your faith faster than your fear. Nothing will kill it and God is calling you to trust him. Fear develops inside Number two, not only does fear develop inside, but number two, doubt builds on the outside. One of the reasons it's so difficult for us to trust God is because doubt builds on the outside. Here's what happens. Look at this on the screen. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Why trouble him any further? Here's what happens. Trusting God becomes even harder when what's happening inside of us begins to get confirmed by others outside of us. Did you see that? Jairus here is having a moment of, of 
a wrestling of faith and doubt in his own heart, and he's wondering, can I really trust God while I'm waiting? Clearly, he, he might not care. And then what happens is somebody comes on the outside and says, hey, don't bother him anymore. He's confirming what's happening to Jairus on the inside. Hope Church, it, it becomes very, very hard to trust God living in isolation. It becomes very, very hard to fight the fight of faith when you're trying to do it all by yourself. This is why godly community is so important. And when we combine the fear inside and the doubt outside by others, trust in God feels nearly impossible. So what do we do? We've identified why it's so difficult to trust God in our lives, but what do we do when all of that's happening inside us? Here's what we do, friends. We start preaching to ourselves what we know to be true about the word of God. We start preaching to ourselves and reminding ourselves of what we know to be true rather than just what we feel to be true in the moment. In short, we remind ourselves of all the reasons why we really can trust our God. And so that's what I wanna do in our time remaining. Why can we trust God in our waiting? Let me give you four reasons from this story. Here's the first reason. Here's why you can trust him. Because the character of God is good. The character of our God is good. Good. It's not just that God does good things, it's because God is good that all that he does is always good. Our God is good. Notice a few things in this story that demonstrates the good character of God. Listen to this. Jesus was willing to help the man in need. We saw that earlier. He continued with the man despite his hopelessness growing to a really low level after the declaration that his daughter has died. Jesus speaks right to the heart of Jairus, speaking to his fear. He knew exactly what he needed to hear in that moment. He, listen to this, removed unnecessary and ingenuine people from the grieving family's presence. He then heals the daughter. This is the central part of the story. He heals the daughter. This is the good character of God. But then he doesn't just heal her. Did you notice this? He, after raising her from the dead, tells her parents, go get this little girl something to eat because nothing makes you more tired than dying and coming back to life. More hungry, excuse me. More hungry. Ah. I lost my breath there, people. <laughs> here's the point, here's the point, here's the point. God is good. God is always good, and in Jesus, we see who God is. Listen to this in Colossians chapter one. I love this verse. Colossians chapter one says, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. What's this verse telling us? You wanna know what God is like? Look to Jesus. You wanna know what God's character is like? Look to Jesus. You know what God sounds like and God speaks like and what God feels about certain things? Look to to Jesus, and in this story, here's what we see about Jesus. He's good, he's kind, he's caring, and he's compassionate. Here's my question for you, Hope Church. Is this how you see God? Is this how you see him? Is this how you relate to your heavenly father? I'm reminded of what A.W. Tozer says. He says, what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Is this what comes into your mind when you think about God? So many people don't see God like this. They see him as distant, aloof, uncaring, unkind. But here in Jesus, we see the character of our God, and it's good. I'm reminded, I'm reminded of the old preacher Charles Spurgeon, what he always used to say. He says, when you can't trace his hand, you can always trust his heart. Why? What's he saying? Listen, you might not be able to tell and discern all that God's trying to do in your life. It may be confusing. You may even question his actions. But here's what you can always trust, that our God is good, that his heart is good, that your father cares for you. We can trust him in our waiting because we can always trust his character. Number two, the, the second reason from this story for why we can trust God is because the power of God is undefeated. Now, this is my favorite part, people, so you better listen close. Jesus speaks here. Jesus speaks in this story, and the power of God flows out of him. The text says that immediately upon hearing the words of Jesus, the words of Jesus bring life to this girl's body. 
the power of God. Jesus, when he speaks to this girl, he speaks in Aramaic. He speaks Talitha, kum. Talitha, this word, probably the best translation, English translation for this word is the word honey or sweetheart. What's happening here when he says Talitha, he's doing what this girl's parents probably call her. He's, they're calling her honey, sweetheart. And then the second thing he says to her is kum, which means to arise or to get up. Jesus is doing what this girl's parents probably do for her every single Sunday morning. Jesus is walking up to this little girl as she's dead, bending down by her bed, grabbing this girl's hand, looking at her and saying, honey, it's time to get up. And in a moment, this girl rises from the dead. Friends, this is the power of God. The power of God is undefeated. You see, Jesus is faith seen death, the greatest of all foes to the human race. Death up until this point has never lost a battle, but then Jesus showed up. <laughs> and when Jesus showed up, he demonstrated his power in such a profound, mighty way that he holds this child by her hand and gently lifts her right up through death itself. The power and authority of God. Jesus is demonstrating that his power is undefeated, that nothing can stay his hand. This begs the question though, why does Jesus say that she was only sleeping? Because to me, I don't know if you, your mind thinks this way or works this way, but for me, when it comes to raising somebody from the dead, in my opinion, my, my thinking is it might take a little bit longer than it happens in this story. That's just my thinking. I don't know. So why does Jesus say she was only sleeping. She's not really dead. Was she, in fact, only sleeping? No, here's what everybody believes who, who studied this story and theologians agree. Here's what's happening. Here's why Jesus says she was only sleeping. Here's what he was trying to communicate. Look at this on the screen. In the presence of Jesus, even death itself is just a nap. I want to remind you, Hope Church, that nothing, nothing, not your situation, I know it looks bleak, nothing is too hard for our God. What is impossible with man is possible for God. Why? Because his power is undefeated. Remind yourself of that, Hope Church. Number three, the third reason we can trust God in our waiting is because the timing of God is perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. Two things I want you to see about the timing of God. Here's the first thing from this story. The timing of God is usually different from ours. We see this in the story. It's usually different. Jesus was in a rush, or Jairus was, was in a rush, and Jesus was not. You ever been in a hurry when God wasn't? This is what's happening in this story. Jesus, through his teaching and through his ministry, he communicates in a lot of different ways basically this truth that God likes to work slowly sometimes. He likes to work slowly sometimes, and it's bothersome for us, but it's, we've gotta trust his plan, and we just need to know as the people of God that God doesn't work on our timetable. He is God, we are not, and so we need to trust him. And so knowing that the timing of God is usually different from ours, here's what it does. It helps us set our expectations right. See, some of you have walked in here this morning and, and you've got an expectation that God's supposed to work on your schedule. And you just need to know God doesn't work on your schedule. And knowing this helps us set our expectations right so that when we don't get our expectations met when it comes to the timing of God, we aren't so defeated as human beings. We need to know that his timing is usually different from ours. But number two, we need to understand that his timing is always for a purpose. God never does anything without purpose. I love this verse in Psalm 115. Listen to how the psalmist describes how God works and, and why he works and what he does in his working. He says, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Another translation of the same verse says that he does whatever, whatever, whatever he pleases. Hope Church, I wanna remind you that God works on purpose and for a purpose, and he does whatever he desires. See, I believe that Jesus allowed this delay because he desired Jairus to see the woman get healed of her issue with blood. 
Why? Because Jesus wanted Jairus to see the healing, and in seeing the healing, something would happen in Jairus that was necessary for what he was about to encounter. Do you see what's happening here? Jesus here was trying to stretch and grow Jairus' faith. Jesus' delay was a means to Jairus' formation into a man who trusted God no matter the circumstances. I love what Pastor John Ortberg says about waiting. Here's what he says. Biblically, waiting is not just something we have to do until we get what we want. Waiting is a part of the process of becoming what God wants us to be. So back to my Vegas story. I had to wait four years. You know my conclusion based upon having to wait all that time? Here's, here's what I am absolutely convinced of. That had I arrived a moment sooner than I did, it would not have been the best thing for me. It wouldn't have been the best thing for me. It wouldn't have been the best thing for this church. It wouldn't have been the best thing for me. If I had moved when I wanted, most likely I would have never married Griffin. If that had never happened, I wouldn't be the dad to my sons, Drake and Jax. And not only that, it became so obvious to me that upon arriving here, had I arrived any sooner, I would have not had the spiritual and emotional maturity to have lasted and thrived in such a different context than where I grew up. Here's my conclusion. Here's my conclusion based on all of my waiting. God's timing for me was perfect. In the moment, I didn't like it. In the moment, I didn't love it. But upon review, God's timing for me was perfect. He knew so much better than I knew. So in, in this story, Jesus is demonstrating to Jairus, as well as to all of us, that his love for us remains consistent for us, despite our questionable delays in our relationship with him. That it is possible for, our, for his love to still be the best thing for us and something that we need and something that is always true despite us feeling like he's a little slow. His love for us is compatible even in our delays. I believe that you and I will always struggle to sense God's love and heart for us when we start imposing our time frame upon him. Because when we start expecting God to work on our schedule, when we start asking him to do what we want and rather us submitting to what he wants for our life, here's what we're doing. We are taking God from his place as God and placing him as creature and placing us as God. And when we do that, friends, it's gonna be so hard for you to sense that God really loves you. Guys, we gotta know our place. We gotta know our place. He is the sovereign God over all the universe. He does whatever he pleases. I am his creation and I submit to him knowing that my God's character is good, his power is undefeated, and his timing is always perfect. But then finally, finally, as we finish, the last thing that we just need to remind ourselves is that the faith of man is necessary. We need to remind ourselves that we have a part to play in our waiting, and our part to play is faith, trusting God. When Jesus said to Jairus, do not fear, only believe, he was talking about the issue of faith. He was talking about the issue of faith. Jesus was asking him, do you trust me, Jairus? And we've got good reason to believe from this story that that Jairus did, that he had a sincere faith, that he was coming to him in his desperation. He was risking his position and his power as a Jewish leader. And he said, forget all about that. I need to come to Jesus. He's my only hope right now. And so he comes to Jesus in sincere faith and he does it because he's desperate. And what we learn from this story is that God honors the faith of the desperate. God honors the faith of desperate people. Could it be, friends, that one of the reasons we don't see God's power demonstrated in our life as often as we would like to is because we are not as desperate as we really think we are. See, I believe one of the great challenges and, and great struggles of American Christianity is the lack of desperation in the hearts of God's people. We really don't believe Jesus' words when he talked to his disciples and he said, apart from me, you can do nothing. See, we hear that verse and we think, oh no, apart from Jesus, we just can't do really awesome spiritual significant things. That's not what he says. He would have said, apart from me, you can't do those things. He says, no, 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 apart from me, you can do nothing. Hope Church, I wanna remind you lovingly that even your breath is a gift from God this morning. Apart from him, you can do nothing. 
So what Jesus is teaching in that verse is that at every moment of your day, no matter your social status, no matter how low you are, no matter how high you are, no matter how good you are, no matter how bad you're doing, every single person lives every single moment utterly desperate for God. This is our neediness. I love what Watchman Nee, the old Chinese church leader, once said. He said this, nobody ever came to God without a need. Nobody ever came to God without a need. Friends, could our problem be that we just don't realize how needy we actually are? What might happen? What might happen if we walked in understanding just how needy and dependent on God we needed to be? What might happen if we understood that every single time we walked into this room or your small group or your home or, or your workplace, your challenging workplace, or while you drove in your car, that, that every single moment is an opportunity to express your neediness and dependence on God. And then we see from this story that God honors the dependence of his people in powerful, unbelievable ways. And so that dependence and that neediness gets transformed into expectation for God. We arrive dependent and needy and we leave going, God, I'm expecting you to do something in this moment, which then creates us more, creates more desperation and neediness upon him because we know that apart from him, we really can do nothing. What if our greatest problem really is that we don't know how needy we are? Is it possible that our capacity for experiencing the presence and power of God is in direct proportion to our level of desperation for God? How desperate are you? Do you trust him? For some reason, God is showing us in this story that God in his sovereignty has chosen to use faith as the means by which we connect to the source of God's power, God himself. God himself, do not misunderstand me. It's not that our faith has the power. It's that our faith connects us to the one who does have the power. Our power does not come from our faith. Our power comes from the one we place our faith into. So as we close, waiting's hard, but don't waste your waiting. I wanna remind you of our sermon in a sentence. God graciously, graciously purposes our waiting to demonstrate his power and authority in our lives. Will you trust him while you wait? See, over the last couple of weeks, we've been studying and seeing what the kingdom of God looks like when it's in action. Jesus has come and he said the kingdom of God is at hand and what we've seen over the last couple weeks is that when the kingdom comes, here's what happens, storms are calmed, the darkness and the demonic are defeated, the untouchable are touched, the unclean become clean, the prestigious and the lowly find their needs met in Jesus, power has entered the story and then what we saw today is that death itself is defeated when the kingdom of God comes in the king, King Jesus. This is the kingdom of God but here's the question, how does all this become possible? How does this become possible? Here's how. Because all of these stories that we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks are just simply pointers. They're pointers to an even greater story. The story of Jesus and his life, death, and resurrection. The gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the greatest story. And Jesus in the gospel defeating death, hell, and the grave is making it possible, not just for a select few individuals, but for anybody, no matter who you are, who would place their faith in him, Jesus is making it possible through the gospel for all of these kingdom realities to become theirs. This is the greatest story on earth. But the question is, how does this become real for me? How does this become possible for me? Here, here's how, through faith. Through faith, through belief, through trust. Do you trust him. So that's the question, no matter who you are today, whether you come in here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus or you do, the question is, are you trusting him? Are you trusting him with your life? Are you trusting him with every single aspect of your life? Not just for your eternity in heaven, but for your reality now. Are you trusting him? I want to encourage you to wait on the Lord because of what Isaiah talks about. Listen to this in Isaiah chapter 40 as we finish. But they who wait for the Lord, here's the promise, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Are you waiting on the Lord? Are you trusting him while you wait? Let me remind you, waiting is where God works. Are you cooperating with the Spirit of God while you wait? So if you're in here today as we finish, 
and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, the invitation is clear. Will you believe in him? Will you trust him? Will you place your faith in him? We've got, we're gonna have pastors down here that would love to introduce you to the person of Jesus and help you place your faith in him. But if you're in here today and you're a follower of Jesus, the call is the same. Do you trust him? Do you trust him? Do you believe in him? Do you place your faith in him? Are you doing that for your circumstance right now? You do that and, and just watch. Wait with expectancy of what God might do in demonstrating his power and authority in your life. We're gonna have pastors down here. We'd love to pray for you if you need prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your work. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters right now. God, would we trust you? Would every single person in the room today, God, would we trust you no matter our life circumstance? Thank you for working in our waiting. We know that you know better than us. God, we love you. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you respond in whatever way the Lord leads?